the lace, Rocket J. Squirrel. And his pal, Bo Winkle the Moose. Hi, glad to see you, Jim. Like we. We got some great things on the show today. Like what? Like what? Well, you ought to know, Bo Winkle. You're in some of them. Today, our program is brought to you by General Mills, where bitter breakfast begins. The most delicious ready to eat cereals in the world. Our story opens today at the Slick Observatory, where an international group of scientists, eggheads and double domes, were meeting to dedicate the new giant 1,000-inch telescope. The chairman, Sir Newton Fugg, was presiding. Today we will prove once and for all that there can be no life on the moon. Dr. Milton Nudnik, egghead of the year, was given the honor of the first peak. What do you see? I see two moon creatures. Impossible! The scientists rushed to the eyepiece, and incredibly, Nudnik was right. Why? It's a moon moose. And he's signaling us. What does he say? He says... Here we come, ready or not. Sure enough, a strange rocket ship had left the moon and was heading straight for the Earth. The word spread in a flash. Extra, extra, moon men to invade Earth. President declares emergency. Now hear this. This is Dorson Bell speaking. The moon rocket ship is nearing the Earth. This invasion is not a play, I repeat. Not a play. Please feel free to panic. And some people did panic. Stores closed, houses were shut up tight. Everywhere, panic reigned. What's the headlines, George? Invasion from moon. Hmm. So what else is new? Meanwhile, at Washington Airport, the newly appointed ambassador to the moon, Krevney Blatt, and other dignitaries and diplomats were waiting for the strange craft to land. Here it comes! The rocket ship had made a perfect one-point landing, and while all eyes watched expectantly, the hatch opened. Welcome, moon people. You dig them earth talk? Bullwinkle, they think we're moon people. They do? Then take me to your president. No, no, no. We got to tell him the truth. Gentlemen, I'm Rocky the Flying Squirrel. And I'm Bullwinkle the Moose. And we're both from Frostbite Falls, Minnesota. Minnesota? You mean you've been to the moon and back? Why, they've discovered a great new rocket fuel. And so do a hero's acclaim, our adventurers told their strange and incredible story. It seemed that just days before, in their little house in Frostbite Falls, Bullwinkle had been baking a quick-rising cake, according to his grandmother's old recipe. But the first layer... Had risen a little faster than they'd expected. And the next thing they knew, the stove had been blown clear to the moon. Well, they had to get it back. Sure, we still owe two payments on it. And so the boys put together their version of a spaceship and used the second layer of that extraordinary cake to propel them to the moon. And the third layer blasted us back. That cake better must be a revolutionary rocket fuel. My boy, you must make more of that cake for your government. Bullwinkle, you're going to be a famous scientist. Well, after all, I am a graduate of MIT the Moose Institute of Toe Dancing. Unfortunately, our boys wouldn't have been so happy had they overheard two notorious spies. You hear, Natasha? First get the formula and then kill the moose or vice versa. And so a short while later, the new director of Guided Moosels was interrupted by... Hello, you great, big, wonderful moose. Boy, that's right neighborly of you. 
You will give me Grandmama's recipe? What the? Well, I hope to be a Grandmama myself someday. I'd love to, but in the explosion, I only saved half my recipe. I know how much, but not what of. Natasha's friend then did a very unneighborly thing. <coughs> Darling, will you please hold this package for me? Well, I'd plan to leave in a couple of minutes. Don't worry, you will. Sounds like a clock. Bullwinkle's steel trap mind had done it again. It was a clock, only attached to 14 sticks of dynamite, and it was wired to go off in 30 seconds. Don't miss tomorrow's exciting episode, Bullwinkle's Ride, or Goodbye, Darling. <laughs> That's a pretty strange-looking painting, Bullwinkle. I just paint what I see. Well, what do you see? This is what I see. Boy, that's smart. What round is it, Rock? The last one, and you got to win this fight. But how? Never fear, guests are here. The cereal that gives you jet energy helps you win. Mm, boy, sugar toasted oat and wheat goodness. Okay, Rock, wind me up. Win with Jet. Here's another goodness cereal from General Mills. And now it's time for... Time for the dancing fool, Bullwinkle. Again? And now for one of our special fairy tales. Yeah. <laughs> It all started out with a plant, a variety of European bellflower used in the making of salads. The plant is called Rampion. This plant grew in a beautiful garden belonging to a mean witch whom everybody feared. Unfortunately, the Rampion could be seen from a little hut belonging to a peasant and his wife. Every day, the wife, who was to have a baby, she'd sit by the window and gaze at the Rampion. Darling, I know this sounds fantastic and utterly absurd, but I have this uncontrollable desire to have a salad made from that European bellflower. You know, Rampion. You mean those weeds there? Rampion, dear. And I fear I must have some or I shall surely die. All right, dear. If it's Rampion you want, Rampion you shall have. And so the husband sneaked to the garden wall, peered over the top, and leaped into the garden of the witch... Rampion, Schmampion. It still looks like weeds to me. Whoops! Halt! You cannot move! You know, you're right. You have come into my garden like a thief. Alas, be merciful. I'm only here because my wife sees your Rampion. I think I'll turn you into a toad. And uh, has such a longing for it that she would die if she could get no Rampion. If that's true, you can take away as much Rampion as you like, but on one condition. You must give me the child which your wife is about to bring into the world. In his fear, the husband consented to everything, and when the baby was born, the witch appeared, gave it the name Rapunzel, which is short for Rampion, and took the little infant away with her. <laughs> Rapunzel grew into a beautiful child. She played in the woods and was very careful of her long hair, which she would comb day after day. When she was 12 years old, the witch shut her up in a tower. It had neither staircase or door, only a small window. Matter of fact, there was only one way to climb up the tower. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. That I may climb the golden stair. And that was the way. Well, a couple of years later, the king's son was walking in the forest and he chanced to hear a song so lovely that he stopped to listen. Do, 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 do. The lovely voice came from Rapunzel's tower. <clears throat> Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. Ooh, that I may climb the golden stair. Wow! Rapunzel, I have searched far and wide, but never has my heart been so touched by song or beauty such as yours. I like you too. 
Will you be my wife and live with me in my kingdom? Yes, I will gladly go with you because actually there doesn't seem to be any future here. I mean, Rapunzel let down your hair, let up your hair. Gives me a headache, I'll tell you. Then it's settled. We'll be married right away. Just let down your hair and we'll be off. Aren't you forgetting something? No. What? Me. If I let down my hair, how am I to get down? Ah, that's right. Well, I think you'd better go now. The witch will soon return. Oh, don't worry, Rapunzel. I'll, I'll think of something. Whoops! Oh, you've come to fetch your lady love. Where well, you goofed. You'll never see her again. <laughs> and so the poor prince wandered, unable to see a thing, eating roots and berries. Meanwhile, back at the tower... Oh, you wicked child! I thought I'd separated you from the world, yet you deceived me just for that! Well, now you've done it. We're both stuck here now. Aren't you forgetting? And so poor Rapunzel was left to live in the tower all alone and in great poverty. The poor prince wandered about in the forest for two years. Then, one day... <laughs> it's... it's hair. Yes, hair it was, for in the two years Rapunzel's tresses had grown to their full length again. Rapunzel, I told you I'd think of something, and I have. Only I can't see. Why don't you take off your hat? I can see. And now I'll climb down your hair, and when I get to the bottom, I'll explain my plan. What's your plan? Jump! Jump! That's your plan? Yes! Some plan! After three days in the barber shop, Rapunzel and the prince were married and lived happily ever afterward. That is, until one day... Darling, I know this sounds fantastic and utterly absurd, but I have this uncontrollable desire to have a salad made from that variety of European bellflower. A rampion? Yes, dear, a rampion. Well, here we go again! <laughs> And now for a more serious note on our program, we bring you the Poetry Corner. Hello there, poetry lovers. Today's poem is the well-known favorite, The Swing by Robert Louis Stevenson. <clears throat> How do you like to go up in a swing, up in the air so blue? Oh, I do think it the pleasantest thing every child can do. Up in the air and over the wall, till I can see so wide, rivers and trees and cattle and all over the countryside. Till I look down on the garden green, down on the roof so brown. Up in the air I go flying again, up in the air and down. How do you like to go up in a swing, up in the air so blue? Oh, I do think it the pleasantest thing ever a child can do. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But... See? <laughs> Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. And now it's time to meet Mr. Peabody. Our story opens today high atop New York City in the luxurious penthouse of perhaps the most famous soldier of fortune the world has ever known. Me. How do you do? Excuse the position, just practicing my yoga. Well, now that you're here, we may as well get to know each other. My name is Peabody. I suppose you know yours. I guess you're wondering about this contraption. It belongs to Sherman. He's my boy. Here, Sherman. Here, boy. Shake hands. Say hello. Hello. Smart as a whip, isn't he? Now about this amusing little gadget. The story really starts with me, naturally. As a youth, I was just an average genius, the puppy prodigy they called me. 
got my degree at Harvard when I was three, Wagner cum laude, of course, then a brief period in the Foreign Service. I speak eight languages fluently, all at once, that is, including English, then a few research projects for the government, and I dabbled in the stock market, where I was known as the Wolf of Wall Street. But somehow I felt that something was missing in my life, so I made up my mind to get a boy. I looked high and low, but couldn't find one that met my high standards. Then one day, while watching some boys at their innocent play, I spotted Sherman. My heart went out to him. I'm always pulling for the underboy. I dismissed the others, and Sherman followed me home. He wasn't at all what I was looking for. Oh, he looked at me with those big brown eyes, but I was firm. I took him home. This is where you live? Yep, that's been home sweet home all my life. Where have you been, you little brat? Just, just visiting. Get in here. One moment, sir. And what do you want, Mutt? The name, sir, is Peabody. And I intend to adopt this boy. Naturally, the newspapers made a big thing of it. Extra, extra, dog to adopt orphan. Doggy wants to be daddy. Read all about it. I had to submit references. So I got some old friends to write letters. Then, of course, I was investigated thoroughly. My background was unimpeachable. Still... But he's not a fit person to bring up a boy. In fact, he's not even a person at all. Your Honor, I consider that an excellent recommendation. And I finally got Sherman. This court can see no reason why. If a boy can have a dog, a dog can't have a boy. Daddy! <laughs> Sherman, let's get one thing clear. I will never submit to being addressed by that ridiculous name. You will call me Mr. Peabody. Or, when speaking informally, simply Peabody. Yes, Mr. Peabody. So, that was that. But I soon found it's next to impossible to raise a boy in an apartment. Guppies, yes, but a boy, no. They need running room. So I built this for Sherman's birthday. Happy birthday, Sherman. Gee, thanks, Mr. Peabody. Well, what is it? Well, actually, it's a time machine. I call it a way back. We just set it, turn it on, open the door, and there we are. Or were, really. Puribosc delenda est, in tres partes argentum sum. What did he say? What did he say? Well, that's simple. He said... Oh, never mind. I'll fix it. So, friends, for a goodbye in a new or used chariot, it's Publius Maximus the Grinning Gaul. It sounded better in Latin. Can we go somewhere else? Of course. With this key, friends. Mr. Franklin, the lightning! I intend to demonstrate the principle but... illustrated by the storage properties of the Leyden jar. BF, the lightning is... Gee, we couldn't get a word in edgewise. I know. A few more adjustments, and behold, not a time machine, but a should-have-been machine. Observe. With this key, friend... Mr. Franklin, your kite is going to be struck by lightning. Oh, really? It's nice to be a part of history. But all in all, it's just the thing for a boy in an apartment. Eh, Sherman? Well, I thought it was. Of course, he's only a boy, and... Mr. Peabody, that's the nicest present anybody ever had. <coughs> Yeah, yes, yes, of course, Sherman. No doubt about it. Every dog should have a boy. Remember how surprised the world scientists were when they looked through their thousand-inch telescope and saw Rocky and Bullwinkle flying back from the moon. But when the boys made their one-point landing, the explanation was ridiculously simple. Bullwinkle had tried to bake a quick rising cake from his grandmother's recipe. The result, naturally, was... the world's most powerful rocket fuel. Bullwinkle was immediately ordered to go to work for the government to duplicate the recipe, which, unfortunately, had been torn in half in the explosion. Yeah, I know how much, but not what of. 
Everybody was interested in the result, including two notorious spies, Boris Badenov and Natasha Fatal. Failing in their attempt to get the formula, they decided to do away with the moose. So Natasha handed him a ticking package containing 14 sticks of dynamite, wired to go off in 30 seconds. I plan to leave in a couple of minutes. Don't worry, darling. You will. But as Natasha tried to open the door, she found it had been locked behind her. The key! Where's the cotton-picking key? Oh, the key. Well, uh, I got it here somewhere. 18 seconds, 17, 16... Let's see, here's the key to my locker at PS84. Hurry up, please! Key to my hope chest. It's little, cause I'm kinda hopeless. I must go quickly! I'm doing my level best. 12, 11, 10. Three trunk keys, in case I ever grow a trunk. Time is running out! Eight, seven, six. Hey, that one belongs to the Frostbite Falls Volunteer Fire Department. Yeah, wonder how they're starting the engine these days. Give me my package, you fool. Three, two, one. That's what I like, precision timing. A few minutes later, Bullwinkle found the right key and the furious Natasha left to meet her partner in crime. Boris promised to meet me here. Where is he? Oh, there you are, darling. What do we do next? We do what any intelligent, self-sufficient spy with real initiative would do. We wait for instructions. Meanwhile, the fact that Bullwinkle's rocket fuel was made from his grandmother's fudge cake recipe was having a great effect on the whole country. Top scientists discarded their most complex apparatus. Erwin, go get me an eight-inch cake tin and a set of cookie cutters. Colleges changed their course of study. This year, gentlemen, we will study atomic structure, nuclear physics, and fudge making. The effect spread to other countries. But you are top nuclear physicist. How come you are sent to Siberia? My biscuits were too heavy. In the USA, grandmothers rose to national prominence. As advisors to the president? It's raining. You'd better put on your rubbers. As scientists... I'd like you to meet our new head of research and development. Hello, boys. Even bathing beauty contests took on a new look. Grandmothers reign supreme. In their own laboratory, Rocky and Bowwinkle were still hard at work. Here's the latest one, Rocky. Will it make a good rocket fuel, Bowwinkle? Well, I don't know, but it'll sure make a dandy lunch. <laughs> The boys wouldn't have been so happy if they had chance to look behind them, for at that moment, a scaly green hand was raising a strange weapon and pointing it right at their heads. Don't miss the next exciting episode, Bullseye Bullwinkle or Destination Moose.
This is an ABC Television Network presentation.